I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese, Inc. Listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Mike Swanson, editor of WallStreetWindow.com. Welcome to the show, Mike. Oh, thanks for having me. It's great to talk with you. One of uh, your acquaintances asked you, how do you make money in the markets today? Is it just all luck? Well, that's an interesting question because um, the the answer uh, I had to this person was that in a certain sense, I was lucky uh, to have gotten into the market when I did. And I told him that if I was brand new and got into the stock market today, I would really have a difficult time making money. Uh, that isn't to say there aren't great opportunities um, out there. Uh, actually, I think there's wonderful opportunities uh, this year, right at this moment, that don't really come around that often. But if you're someone just new, uh, it can be very difficult to know what they are and uh, take advantage of them. And typically, when someone starts out in the stock market, they just buy U.S. stocks. They get a mutual fund or they turn on the CNBC and try to buy the picks on there or something. And when I started out, it was the late 1990s, and the stock market was going straight up. And I was buying Internet stocks. I was buying uh, the, one of the first stocks I bought was a stock pick in Business Week, and it went from about $15 to $40 you know, in, in, in like six weeks. And it was a wonderful time. And I was lucky uh, to have gotten involved in the markets then because you didn't have to know much uh, to make money. You just had to be in the market. But it's just not like that anymore. Uh, the stock market hasn't done anything now in, oh, well, over a year, really uh, a year and a half, uh, and it's just going up and down. Uh, this week is a perfect example of that the Dow is up 200 points yesterday and today, it's down 200 points, and all it's doing is going sideways. Uh, I, I actually think it's in a dangerous position. Uh, the action, to me, is very similar to what we saw in the summer uh, around July and August, and also in November. Uh, in November, we had this giant rally that took place in October, and the market went sideways into December, then dumped in January, and that's kind of the same pattern we're in. And one thing that happened then is that a lot of stocks <clears throat> didn't perform well. Uh, the internals of the market did poorly. That means there are lots of stocks that were declining and acting worse than the averages are doing. And that's actually now starting to happen again. Um, the obvious way uh, people can see this is if you look at the NASDAQ, the NASDAQ is lagging the Dow and S&P 500. And the Russell 2000 is, is doing the same thing. The NASDAQ's actually below the 150-day moving average. Uh, while it's true the S&P 500 and Dow are above them, uh, it looks like a slow kind of topping pattern to me. I'm not looking for a sudden drop next week or anything, but I think we're kind of like where we were in November, December, and or, or really last July and August before the big drop at the end of August. So volume vanishes and the market just drifts around and you get up days that don't go anywhere. That is a very difficult market uh, for most people to make money in, and especially if you're someone starting out that just wants to buy the picks that you see on the television set. And the reason why it's really difficult is because the market isn't going anywhere in a sustainable manner. Uh, when I started in 1999, uh, in the late 90s, the market pretty much went up every single month to a new high and would go higher, and stocks 
all over the place would do the same thing. So when you're in a really powerful bull market, you can be invested and watch your account grow almost every single month. And now very few people are experiencing that anymore uh, because market's just not doing that. That makes most people just kind of stop paying attention. It's not exciting to them. It is exciting when you know you're making money and you want to look at your account balance grow. But when that's not happening, most people just kind of fall asleep and stop paying attention. The ratings on CNBC drop. The volume in the market starts to dissipate. That's where we are. Now, if the market were to <laughs> fall uh, 20% or something, people would start to get scared and start paying attention. But that's where most people in the United States are at. They're just kind of like sitting there um, and, you know, bored with things. But in reality, um, there are ways to make money, and they weren't there last year either, but now they are. And that's new bull markets that are starting in gold, or have started already in gold, uh, in the mining stocks, uh, you know, the GDX gold stock ETF, which I do own, it, it basically doubled from its low in January to just the other week. Uh, it's just really short amount of time. And when you can have an entire sector go up 100%, uh, that leads to exciting gains and also for the stocks inside the sector. Uh, now, in most bull markets, when they start, go on three to five years. So there's huge opportunities there, similar to the type of opportunities I had when I was a new investor buying Internet stocks. It's really the gold stocks that uh, people need to get involved in. Uh, it's not so much a matter of luck in that sense, but being at the right place at the right time. I was in the right place at the right time with Internet stocks, it's a long time ago now, um, it, but gold stocks is, a, is now that place. Uh, the trick is trying to convince or, or, or tell people that, you know, it's easy to you think, well, I'm going to buy the stock market because everyone talks about it, but in the United States, not very many people at all talk about investing in mining stocks, especially now because, they topped out in 2011 and went through a huge bear market. And the funny thing about financial markets, they do operate on a supply and demand uh, thing to make the prices. And when you see a bear market happen, what is really going on is supply is hitting the market because people are selling stocks and the demand is going down. And that's what makes stocks drop. The prices drop. So when you get to an end of a bear market, prices are low because there's no demand <laughs> for the stocks. There's no real interest in them. Uh, but that's what makes for low valuations. That's what makes for great investment points. And even though the mining stocks have gone up 100% from that low, they, you know, have done that after having fallen, uh, a lot of them, over 90% over a couple of years. So the valuations are still low. You can... Look at how the stocks are priced by their book value. A lot of them are trading at half a book value, and a lot, of, and they're all as a whole, uh, they're trading at a steep discount to the price of gold and their ounces in the ground that they own, and so forth. This is really uh, the only other time they've been this cheap that I've been in the market was back in the uh, in, in the early uh, 2000 to 2002. Uh, they did crash in 2008, of course, with the stock market, but uh, even those valuations that they fell to aren't as low as what they are now or back in the, uh, the 2000 and 2002 time period. So yeah, I think it works for a wonderful opportunity to get involved in them. Mike, is the big deal really not listening to these, I call them yelling sellers? I think so in the long run. I mean, I, I, I did. I mean, I did in the late 90s and it worked. But it, the only time it works is when you're in a powerful overall U.S. stock market bull market like you saw back then or like we saw in 2013 when the market went up that year 
uh, substantially without ever pulling back. But when you're not in one of those type of time periods, the advice on there becomes useless uh, because, you know, they're just, it's just so generic that it just doesn't really pay off. And so what you saw last year was a real focus on giving up almost on, on trying to make money in the stock market. If you watch Fast Money and in the Kramer show, they kind of <clears throat> stopped talking about the stock market as a whole and started telling you just to focus on a couple stocks, the, the so-called FANG stocks, the Facebook, the Amazon, Netflix, and Google, because they were still going up and doing really well. And, you now what's happened this year is uh, the Netflix and Google have faltered uh, but Facebook and Amazon are, are, are still uh, doing okay. Uh, but I, I, I really, you know, to me, you, when you look at buying something, you have to look at what's your potential return and, and what you're are risking there. And I just don't, at this point, don't see how they make sense, um, especially when you compare them to the opportunity that we have in, in the mining stock sector, and one thing I'd like to emphasize, which is really important uh, with what's going on in mining stocks, is if you compare them to biotech, the biotech sector, um, you can see an important difference, which is really telling for what's going on in the mining stocks and also what's going on in the U.S. stock market. Now, biotech stocks, uh, they had a huge run in 2014. Uh, they were really this, one of the strongest sector in the, in the stock market that year. Uh, and then they started to falter, uh, in lag last year. And now they're performing very poorly. Uh, but it's a speculative sector. There are giant drug companies, Amgen, um, uh, Biogen and so forth. But there's also hundreds of very speculative biotech companies that don't make profits. They are trying to discover a wonder drug and so forth. And that's one way that sector is similar to the mining sector because the mining sector uh, has a, a basket of large cap mining stocks in it, but there are also hundreds of very speculative exploration and junior mining stocks that don't really make a profit and they're trying to drill uh, properties to discover mineable deposits uh, and then make deals with the major companies or get bought out or raise money to develop the mine or, or whatever the case. So it's a little similar to the biotech sector in that you have companies that are speculative and they're doing research <laughs> or drilling to hit the mother load, let's say. And for biotech companies, it's, it's discovering a wonder drug. What's interesting, though, about these two sectors is I still see people, the biotechs are in a fair market. They're below the 200-day moving averages. They're one of the worst performing sectors in the stock market since uh, July of last year. However, there's a, I, see, I read lots of commentary from people that want to buy them uh, because you know, they, they played them in 2014 and had fun and they just believe in, in, in medicine and, you know, discoveries and think this is the future. And they want also this sector to do good because they think that'll help the overall stock market out and, and, you know, and so forth. But what's fascinating about the sector is that if there's two major biotech ETFs, uh, one is BBH, it trades you know, the, in the United States. And if you look at what's happened over the past couple uh, weeks and months, we have had a big rally in the stock market. I think it's over, but it happened. Uh, uh, and uh, the interesting thing is the biotech ETF, it lagged the rally. But if you look outside that ETF, it did bounce. But if you look at the biotech stocks that aren't in the ETF, they didn't go up at all, and they didn't have any volume at all. They just sat there dying, even while the stock market rally took place and even while the biotech ETF went up. What that means is there's no real bottom in that sector. All there was was robot trading playing the ETF and 
short covering and whatever in the large biotechs that are also in the ETF. But if they're not in the ETF, they don't do enough volume to make the robots want to play them and they're ignored by everyone else. The thing is that if there was a real, real major bottom in the biotech sector, there'd be buying across the entire sector, including in the small, more speculative stocks, and it just isn't happening. So biotech hasn't bottomed. That's a key uh, thing to think about and keep in mind for people who are only focused on the U.S. stock market. Now, if we flip that around, though, and look at the mining sector, what's happened there uh, is very telling because, yes, we've had GDX go up 100%. Big caps such as Newmont and Barrick and Yamina and, and on and on have also rallied uh, substantially. But so have hundreds of junior mining stocks. The volume in them has picked up and exploded. Um, if you look, uh, I have access. I use a, a program uh, called TC2000. It enables me to just look through hundreds of these biotech or hundreds of these uh, junior mining stocks. Uh, within an hour or so, and when I do it, I see the volume coming into them. Uh, many of them are going up even more than GDX has gone up. So there's widespread buying across the board, the entire uh, mining stock complex, and that's what you want to see at the start of a new bull market. They, these, some of these small stocks have even better chart patterns than the big ones had. They based out longer. They, they kind of put in a bottom last July, but didn't make a new low in January, and, and, you know, they're not all trading, you know, exactly the same, like in the sense of breaking out on the same day or something. Uh, some of them are still basing, which creates opportunities to buy them as they break out. Uh, so there's all kinds of trading opportunities in this sector. It's, it's really wonderful, and, and I think all this is telling us that this is a real thing going on. It's not just a rally in an ETF, but... Uh, you know, real money coming into a sector like this and, and this money that goes into these type of junior stocks, you know, it's not trading robot money. It's, it's real investment money. We'll have more with Mike Swanson right after the break. I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese, Inc., listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome back. We're chatting with Mike Swanson. Mike, an area that people may be uh, very concerned about is retail. So many big box stores that are the anchors for shopping malls are having a very rough time. And if that big box store goes under, it'll take the whole mall with it because they pay most of the rent. Yeah, that's becoming a more and more serious trend. I mean, I see it uh, (laughs) where I live and other towns I've gone to, too, where the malls are becoming more and more empty. Uh, and we've seen, uh, actually stores such as JC Penney's, uh, some of the sports stores, uh, announced that they're going to close up some of the stores that they are operating, uh, and lay people off and so forth. Uh, the funny thing about this though is if you go back, uh, 2013 to 2014 were such key years for the U.S. stock market because that's the, the 2013 and 2014 is when we had the giant rally. Uh, without the pullback, uh, the, really, I think that was this, a real speculative blow off. And one of the things that happened was, um, not only did the biotech stocks go up a lot, but the retail stocks did too, uh, and restaurant stocks. And, uh, they went up so much that they reached really crazy valuations. Uh, so one of the things that's been happening really since July, is along with the biotechs, the retailers and restaurant stocks have also been among the worst performing sectors in the entire stock market. And one of the things we've been seeing are restaurant stocks like Chipotle, uh, Domino's Pizza, uh, Papa John's, uh, almost all of them really, uh, have at some point or another over the past six months 
had bad earnings and blown up and they're and the same thing now is happening to retail and the restaurants really did this first and now it appears this is now spreading over into the retail sector and when you see stocks fall because they've had bad news after they've gone up for a long time uh typically what will happen is if that happens during the next earnings season so you have two back to back bad earnings reports uh, occur, what tends to happen after that is the stock just continues to decline uh, and people really start to wake up and start thinking, well, more bad news is coming, i got to get out of this, and so forth. Uh, actually, one of the biggest retail companies in the world is really Apple, you know, with their iPhone gadgets, uh, and this is exactly what we saw occur with Apple. They started out with a bad earnings release in July. They came out with another one in October. And the stock is now one of the worst performing stocks in the Dow. And now this is now happening with Target and Pennies and, you know, all these other kind of retail stocks too. Uh, does that mean there's something, you know, wrong with the economy that retail spending hasn't, isn't doing what people predicted it would do? Um, you know, it would seem to suggest that now. There's other people who try to wash that over and they say, well, no, it's just because Amazon's so big and everyone wants to shop online that there's nothing wrong. So don't worry and just buy Amazon and then you'll be okay. Uh, so that's kind of the advice and the strategy that is now becoming prevalent, like on the Internet uh, or CNBC, is just hide in the few stocks doing okay. Uh, and you'll be all right. But I, I think that's what you also see in a more bearish stock market, too, uh, where people do that. They think, well, you know, there's these couple stocks. I'll just get in there and everything else is crappy. But in, in reality, you got to, I think, uh, do much more and get into new bull markets. And, you know, don't you try to do quick trades necessarily or, or think that, uh, I just want to make some money because this stock might go up 5%. I like to try to buy things where I think I have a real possibility to make huge money over a couple of years. Uh, you know, if I want to try to make 5% in some quick trade, uh, that's tough and you might as well just go to the slot machine is, is my thinking or, or a blackjack table. Your odds are better for blackjack than the slot machine. Uh, but it's, it's, it's still, uh, not much better than, than trying to go for the little gains in little trades. Uh, but that's, that's, everyone's got their different way of investing. Well, the retail sector, for the most part, has been shocked and stunned by the continuing rapid rise in online shopping. Many, you know, outlets like Nordstrom's or Macy's, I mean, they've been great names, you know, through history, but, uh, and they do their very best to treat customers like gold. But people, you know, the shopping experience isn't as important to them as finding a good deal. Yeah, well, actually, uh, the best example of that is the book industry. Uh, I mean, Amazon and online shopping has devastated uh, the bookstore, the physical bookstore. Uh, I mean, we've had borders, uh, I think, went bankrupt, a Barnes and Noble store around, but, you know, they're just hanging on, and so many small mom and pop bookstores across the United States have closed up. In the town I live in, there isn't even a bookstore within an hour's drive. So, so that's the devastation that's created, and, you know, the thing about it is Amazon, if you want to buy a bestseller, the, their prices are cheaper than you'd see in a physical bookstore for the most part, and you can get free shipping. You know, if you pay for their, uh, uh, program to do that, and it's like 10 bucks a year or something. So, Walmart still has books, but, you know, they only carry a, a couple. So you have more choices on the internet if you just use that as one example. Uh, so, yeah, but the thing is, you just, <laughs> that, that drains away, uh, small businesses and the people that used to work in them and, and so forth. So, and, and I don't really think it's a necessarily, I also think there is something to say that there, you know, the retail spending as a whole really isn't 
going up from where it was a year ago. Uh, the Christmas sales, even with the boom in online uh, stuff that was taking place last Christmas, the sales were actually down uh, as a total from where they were the year before. So I don't, you know, they, all, money is shifting online, but it's not really a huge overall retail boom, and it's it's hitting, of course, the the retailers that charge more prices or or more trouble to go to or whatever, they're going to be the ones that suffer the most in a more slack or slowing uh, economy. You know, if the economy was booming and everyone was getting rich and making money, I don't think they would care so much about trying to find these bargains. Um, another example where this has taken place, of course, is Walmart, uh, where uh, Walmart stock is also among the worst performing stocks in the Dow, and the reason why is because so many people have decided that, well, I'm going to stop going there because I have no money. I'm going to go to the Dollar General store uh, or Family Dollar and just trying to survive there. Uh, so Walmart suffered from that. Yeah, I, you know, I, I kind of wonder though, people who are buying meat at a dollar store. Folks, I think you might be getting what you pay for. Yeah, well, you can buy canned food. <laughs> it's what you can get. Yeah, uh, it, it's kind of scary sometimes. Yeah, sure. You know, spelling mistakes on the can and stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mike, thank you very much for chatting with us. Oh, thank you. It's great to talk with you as always. My guest has been Mike Swanson, editor of WallStreetWindow.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. Find us on Twitter at TalkDigitalNet. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Comments or questions for the show can be sent to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com Radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.